Well, good morning to you all and uh, welcome to the webinar. My name is Eric Famai. I'm from the Belgian Chinese Chamber of Commerce and we are very glad that we can host this event in cooperation with Flanders Investment and Trade. Now, before we start some practical matters, the webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on the website of the organizers. You can put your questions in the chat box and we shall put as many questions as possible to our speakers at the end of the webinar, not after each individual presentation. If your question is already in the chat box, just add a like mark so that we can pick it up as a priority. As to the program, we shall start today with a five minute introduction by Sara Landaut. Sara is the manager investment promotion at the Development Authority of the province of Antwerp, known to all of us as POM Antwerpen. Following Sarah, we will have two presentations um, presented to us by uh, China experts that have been seconded to us by the EU SME Center. First, we will have Robert Goris, who will introduce the center and present some practical steps for companies on how to take on China. Robert has worked for 12 years in China, both for a private company and for the Benelux Chamber of Commerce. Next will be Johnny Browais, and Johnny is a resident in Shanghai, having lived in China for 20 years. I would therefore qualify him as a Flemish expert with Chinese characteristics. And who better than Johnny to talk about the challenges for Western companies in China? And if those challenges seem daunting, think of the support that is available from the EU SME Center, from POM Antwerpen, from the Belgian Chinese Chamber of Commerce, and most accessibly for Flemish companies, of course, Flanders Investment and Trade. Michelle Surings, she's the Director for Trade with East Asia, will outline how FIT can support you. Following the presentation from FIT, we shall have a 20-minute Q&A. And finally, on my side, allow me a few words about our Chamber. We are a strategic partner of Flanders Investment and Trade, but as the Belgian National Chamber, we are positioned as the contact of choice when Chinese officials and private companies look at Belgium. Most of our activities are open also to non-members, but membership will obviously give you the best possible access to what we have to offer. And that includes seminars and webinars now. And I know digital events and webinars can be boring and tiresome, but they are a fantastic medium to reach a faraway audience. Last week, the Chamber did a B2B webinar where we gave 10 high-tech companies, happened to be all from Flanders area, we gave them the chance to present themselves to a Beijing-based technology hub. It was fascinating to see how lively the interaction was, and it reminded me that even if the latest Chinese economic plan emphasizes Chinese technological independence and indigenous innovation, there is still great opportunity for intense cooperation between Chinese and foreign companies. So keep these two things in mind and go for it. And with this message, I would like to pass on the screen to Sarah. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Erik. Uh, I will now start sharing my screen. It should show up in a second. Normally, now everyone uh, should be able to see the presentation. So I will start with indeed a very brief introduction on Cleantech Route China. Uh, if there would be any trouble uh, viewing the uh, presentation, um, please give me a sign. <clears throat> Uh, Cleantech Route China is a, is a cooperation between the five uh, Flemish provinces, um, several provincial development authorities or POMs, uh, 
Cleantech Flanders and Flanders Investment and Trade. Uh, given this partnership, of course, the support and activities are aimed at Flemish companies. I see there's an issue with my presentation. All right. Yeah. Uh, Cleantech Lutechina is the continuation of the I2PCC project uh, that ran from 2018 until uh, uh, 2020. Uh, it was a European funded uh, project and it gave us the opportunity uh, to set up a new and joint activity program, which will now be um, continued and, and fine tuned over the coming years. Uh, the support and activities we, uh, we offer through Cleantech Route China are focused on uh, informing, uh, promoting and connecting, as you can see on the slides. Uh, our focus in China um, is uh, on the sister cities and provinces of the Flemish provinces and the areas covered by the FIT offices, which you can all see on the map. Um, through long-time cooperation, we have developed strong relations and extensive networks with local governments, companies, uh, knowledge institutions, and so on. How we can serve you? Well, uh, we inform uh, Flemish cleantech companies on different aspects of the Chinese market in order to uh, prepare uh, for uh, actual business exchange. Um, we offer a hands-on approach and we are also open for individual questions. It's quite similar to the setup of this series of webinars, actually. Um, <clears throat> Uh, more information uh, can be found on our website, uh, which is visible on the slides. Um, on the website, you can find information, advice, case studies, relevant uh, events, and of course, you can also register for our newsletter. You can also request uh, our print brochure, which is uh, also visible on the slide. However, the website and brochure are, of course, also uh, both in Dutch only available. Um, an overview of the upcoming webinars within this uh, series, as you can see after today, we still have five more webinars with uh, uh, several different topics. Uh, some webinars are more general, some webinars will be more aimed at tech or clean tech uh, companies. Um, of course, don't forget to register for each uh, webinar you wish to attend. Um, uh, you can uh, register through either the website of Cleantech Route China or you can register directly on the website of Flanders Investment and Trade. Some upcoming activities by uh, Cleantech Route China. Um, we have a, um, an online mission to uh, Chongqing and Chengdu in cooperation with Flanders Investment and Trade. Uh, registrations are currently open uh, and are open until May 7th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <clears throat> of course, the uh, activities uh, mentioned on this slide are again uh, for uh, Flemish uh, companies. Um, the mission is uh, multi-sectoral, so um, it's not only open for clean tech companies. The expos that are mentioned on the slide, such as the CPEC Beijing and the IE Expo, are uh, focused on clean tech, uh, so are of course aimed at those uh, companies. More future events will be uh, mentioned on our website uh, in the coming months, of course. Uh, over the past years, we have put together a catalogue of Flemish clean tech companies. Uh, we will make an update before the expos that will be attended uh, during the summer in Beijing and Guangzhou. But we also use the catalogue uh, to promote Flemish clean tech companies uh, through our network of representatives and during other events, meetings and encounters with uh, Chinese companies and governments. 
uh, as we are making an update and if you are interested to present your company uh, through this catalog uh, you can contact myself uh, and i will um, inform you on the details for the update of course this is really focused on companies with clean tech activities uh, but don't hesitate to contact me uh, if you would like to be represented in the catalog well, that's, uh, that's it for my part. Thank you all for your attention. I wish you all a very interesting webinar and I would like to give the floor now to Mr. Robert Coris. Thank you very much. I'll directly try to share my screen. I hear that there's an echo. Yeah, perfect. So thank you very much for the uh, introduction and um, uh, the information on clean tech route China. Um, today um, I will talk to uh, with Johnny on um, doing business in China, a checklist and support for companies, clean tech companies, or any companies, companies that want to go to China. I'm first gonna explain a little bit about the EU SME center that uh, we represent today. So the USME center was a project funded uh, by the European Commission in 2010. It's already the third phase of the EU SME center and the key of the EU SME center is to get SMEs ready for doing business in China. Um, the USME center is part of the uh, EEN network um, and has partners over 270 uh, government uh, agencies in Europe located in Beijing. But because they have such a wide partner network, they're able to reach far into Europe and advise and inform uh, European SMEs as doing business in China. And it's a cooperation between um, five different uh, organizations, the Italian Chamber, the, Britain, the, British, uh, the China Britain Business Council, the Danish Chamber, Eurochambre, and the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. So if we specify on uh, the services um, the EU SME Center does is they have a knowledge center, an advice center, uh, a training center, and an advocacy uh, platform. The knowledge center is a place where you can find a lot of information on reports, um, about over 200 reports on their website. Uh, the advice center is a place where you can ask questions to uh, experts of the center or get uh, 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 get referred to experts like Johnny and me to advise you on uh, specific uh, questions on doing business in China. The training center, I think this webinar is part of it. Uh, we work together with partners where we uh, exchange knowledge on doing business in China and the Atmos, uh, SME advocacy platform which is run by the EU SME, uh, which is run by the EU CCC that tries to defend your um, uh, uh, your case in the Chinese uh, in the Chinese economy so that there's, for example, a level playing field for uh, foreign companies in China. If we look at the Knowledge Center more uh, clearly, uh, there's over 200 reports, I said, and it is interesting to see that the EU SME Center has gone with the Chinese um, economy. In the past, there was a lot of information of uh, food and beverage, maybe, but now we see very active topics like healthcare, environment, green tech, um, AI, and even blockchain uh, was recently um, promoted as uh, uh, content from the EU SME Center. Um, there's also uh, the, the, the website where you can ask questions. Um, and ask uh, an expert on uh, doing business in China. I think you can um, log on uh, the website and register at the website for free. Um, I think that's uh, great uh, that you that's so much uh, information available for you. Um, a thing that I also want to uh, mention uh, is the uh, self-diagnostic tool. I think the self-diagnostic tool uh, covers a lot of information we are discussing um, today. Uh, so it covers things like, uh, do you understand the, the maybe the culture in China? Do you understand the different ch uh, uh, channels of entry? Um, how to deal maybe with contracts? So it asks us a lot of questions on, on, on if you're ready or if you thought about uh, doing business in, in China. So also uh, a free Two, um, I'm Dutch and so I like everything that's free. So uh, I would definitely uh, support everybody to uh, join this self-diagnostic tool. Um, 
for the upcoming events um, of uh, the EU SME Center. Um, there are many uh, different um, uh, events uh, we just saw already from the uh, Clean Tech Route to China. There's a lot of interesting events, but the EU SME Center also has a lot of interesting events where you can participate um, on water management, building and design, the Hainan Free Trade Port, um, cross-border e-commerce, so a lot of information is for free and available. And I would really uh, urge you to follow this. If you're interested in China, try to follow these um, webinars or read this report because there's a lot of valuable information for you to absorb when doing business, uh, when going to China and start doing business in China. So very quickly um, about me because then we uh, for um, uh, go into the presentation uh, on the practical steps. So Robert Gore is director of Northern Europe for the Sovereign Group, recently moved from China to Brussels. Uh, my focus is on corporate structuring and uh, compliance in China. Um, and I'm very happy here today that I am able to um, share this information um, with you. What I'm going to um, discuss today, uh, the 14th five year plan. I know there's going to be another presentation on the 14th five year plan in a later stage, but I think it is important to discuss the 14th five year plan because it's an essential part of when you enter the Chinese uh, market. So I will quickly discuss what it is and then I will discuss on uh, market entry, the perception, the reality of doing business in China, um, how to address these challenges, why enter and also uh, what is the right structure. Then Johnny will take over and we'll do a, a Q&A. Uh, so with further ado, I think let's dive into uh, the content of the presentation. The 14th five year um, plan. Um, that's a very important document um, in China. I think um, last year uh, there was a plenum, the fifth plenum, which is a party activity where the party sets goals or sets guidelines, uh, makes recommendations towards the government um, on what should be in the 14th five year um, plan. And they promote like broad themes, like for example, high speed growth, uh, with high speed quality, rebalancing an economy with supply side structural reform, a lot of big words, expanding domestic demand while continuing to support international export markets. That's the dual strategy. If you have um, read a little bit upon um, China policy, the dual strategy is often uh, mentioned. So that is focuses on um, um, expanding domestic demand, what is already mentioned in the intro, but also continuing support of international export markets and driving modernization through the innovation is a theme and promoting high end intelligence and green production. So these are very broad themes that were um, introduced by the party as recommendations. But from those recommendations, there needs to be a 15, uh, 14, five year plan. And that's done during the uh, two sessions. The two sessions was uh, beginning of this year where the 15, uh, 14 five year plan was promoted. And then is where uh, the government really sets fixed indicators. There are five themes, 20 indicators and certain indicators are, for example, urbanization by 2025 should be 65% or the share of surface water should become better class three and will must reach an 85% by the end of the of the uh, plan. So very clear indicators and I'm going to go quickly into those indicators, um, not all of them, but to give you an idea. So I mentioned that there are five uh, themes uh, on the next slide. There are other uh, two themes. So we have economic development, innovation, uh, people well-being. Um, lean ecology and security and safety. And what I think is I'm not going to go into each specific indicator, but I think what is mostly interesting is what is on the side is indicative and binding um, indicators. On the next slide, you will see all binding indicators and indicative indicators are indicators that are nice to have. Right, so the, the government wants to uh, uh, push for it. But it's nice to have and binding criteria are things they must achieve. They're the things they have set to themselves. We must achieve this. 
And then, for example, here, uh, the years of education for the working age people needs to go up. So these are things that are um, um, uh, good to know. And I think the next slide is where um, it is very clear um, and very valuable, I think, for entering uh, the Chinese uh, market. For example, in green ecology, security and safety, these are all binding um, binding indicators. So the Chinese government has set themselves like we will achieve these goals. So if you are in a specific industry and you know that this is within falls within the binding um, indicates of the Chinese government, this is a clear opportunity. So, for example, how reducing energy if you're in energy, um, if you are in um, wastewater or if you are in uh, ag certain agricultural fields or in technology, I think there are clear indicators, uh, binding even indicators that there are opportunities for um, you. If we broaden that a little bit on where I see the opportunities are following the 14 five year plans, I think we can divide it in, in four uh, major themes, technology, healthcare, education and clean energy. If we talk about um, technology, things like AI, semiconductors, IoT, uh, interconnectivity is a clear um, opportunity. Healthcare, um, elderly care, biotech is a clear uh, um, opportunity, I believe. Um, education, I think education is a little bit of a tricky one because education is an industry that is very highly regular, regulatized or uh, very, uh, uh, very much looked at the Chinese government, so you don't have uh, a lot of freedom to move there as a company. Um, clean energy, I think energy upgrades, efficiency, water treatment, I think in that sense everything has to do with uh, sustainability or the environment is a clear opportunity. The 14 five year plan also has indicated um, major areas uh, of, of focus. Uh, one is the Greater Bay, uh, the Greater Bay area um, that has a clear uh, focus with um, Hong Kong. Um, and Macau uh, and places like Shenzhen, Dongguan, uh, Guangzhou, Foshan. These are very interesting areas uh, where a lot of focus by the Chinese government is, is put on. But also uh, Hainan uh, is a place of interest um, where there's a free trade zone, a free trade port is built and a medical fast track where you can uh, promote medical devices, where there's an easier access to the market uh, for medical devices, for example. So I think I think these are the key factors for the um, uh, 14 five year plan. Um, and as you see, there's a lot of opportunities binding, um, binding indicates that can be an opportunity for you as a company. So I think that's very um, good news. So then we go into market entry and the perception of um, doing business in China is China is a is sometimes a wonderland, right? It's a huge market, 1.3 billion people. Um, I always use the example, I don't know if it's an urban legend, but uh, the, the example has been uh, expressed many times where Gillette at one point wanted to enter the Chinese market uh, with deodorant. They made the analysis 1.3 billion people, that's 2.6 billion armpits, that's going to be a business, but they forgot that at that time, nobody in China used deodorant. So it is maybe a perception of a wonderland um, and there's a lot of um, um, opportunities, but my thought is that in reality, it is a minefield. It is a minefield because there's a, little, a lot of things unclear and you are unfortunately not, will not be the first company not making it in China. Um, there have been companies before you that have lost thousands, hundred thousand, maybe millions of dollars, euros in entering China. So being prepared is very important. And I would like to explain why I think and why uh, people uh, with me think why China is challenging. And so you know to where to look for. So why is uh, China uh, challenging? Um, I think the big reason why China is, is, is challenging is because it's geographically fragmented. China is a huge, huge place. It's slightly bigger than the US. Um, and I think from a cultural 
perspective, it looks a lot like Europe, of course, very different. But what I want, what I mean with that is in this massive landmass that China has, there are many different ethnic groups. There are eight languages spoken. There are 50, um, uh, 56 different ethnic groups. Um, it's uh, the climate is different. The food is different. The development is different. And I think that's a very much similar sometimes to Europe, right? Europe is, a, is, a, is also a place where a lot of different cultures, different languages are um, spoken. Um, for example, I, I said, already mentioned it, I'm Dutch, my wife is Belgian. We lived an hour from each other. Uh, I'm on the, on the Dutch side, see on the Belgian side, and I know that there's still a world of difference between the Dutch and the Belgians. So if there's already such a big difference in such a small area, you can imagine that in China, with such a big uh, landmass, there's also a massive amount of difference. So that's you can't see China as just one place. Secondly, I think there's a frustrating regulatory environment. Um, what I mean with that is the, for example, what is often mentioned also in, in the news is the, the idea of uh, rule by law and uh, versus rule of law where um, we in Europe have rule of, rule of law, where there's a law and that is there to protect you and guide you. But in China, it's uh, what they say is rule by law, is that um, the laws may be there, but it's only used to, to help the party or um, help to guide uh, policy. It's not there really to protect you. Of course, it's very, I'm saying it now very um, in a nutshell, but I think that's the general, perception. Um, vague and confusing regulations, sometimes regulations even um, contradict each other. So that's because China is growing so fast that regulation not always is lagging behind the development of China and also an uneven enforcement of those regulations. If you look, for example, at uh, the Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, these are big cities where sometimes regulation are forced uh, are more uh, enforced. And if you look at places more inland um, where these enforcements are less, uh, but also compared to companies, foreign companies, domestic companies, where um, enforcement is a little bit uneven sometimes. Multiple agencies, jurisdictions. China is a very big uh, place and there are pockets of um, regulatory differences. For example, Hainan is now an area that is very much in development and a lot of new policies there that only apply to Hainan or in the Shanghai free trade zone there were policies or maybe there are policies and specific rules uh, in western China that um, are different from other places so it's it could be very complex and doing your homework is very um, key in that so a rapid um, development, I think, is also a very big uh, challenge for um, for people doing uh, business in China. I think this is a picture of uh, the Pudong of Shanghai. Uh, 30 years ago, it was farmland and now it has the tallest buildings in the world. So and that massive uh, change is sometimes difficult for foreign companies to uh, to handle. It goes so quick um, that the moment the, the, the European company has decided to make a certain move, the market has already changed. So there's a very different uh, approach uh, on this. And because of that rapid change, consumer taste has changed rapidly um, um, and the, the, the market conditions changed rapidly. So 12 years ago when I came to China, there was something like QQ. There was a messaging um, app. Um, but now everything is WeChat and QQ is, is, is disappeared. And I think um, what gave uh, a very good uh, picture. So um, Johnny, I know you're going to be later on the call. Um, I stole the last uh, this picture from um, Johnny. I, he posted uh, a few days ago on his LinkedIn, the life change index. This shows how much China has changed over a few uh, last decades compared to other nations. So let me quickly, I think Belgium is here and China is there. So that shows you that there's so much change 
in China that you can't just pack your bags and move from Belgium or from Europe to China and think you will understand. You need to emerge yourself in this to really understand. So I think the commitment to China is important to succeed there. And Johnny, thank you for posting that picture. It was very informative. Um, I think another challenge for um, China is an immature market. Um, as I said, highly fragmented, minimal brand value, and uh, price usually is the key. So highly fragmented. Um, what I mean with this is like, um, again, um, the wishes of somebody in Shanghai or the wishes of somebody in, in Beijing are very different. And I think that needs to be um, thought of. So if you want to enter China, you should really think about where in China. Do your research, Where are where is the market? Should I go to Beijing? Should I go to... Um, Shanghai, should I go inland, or should I go to second tier cities? Um, so everything can be a specific um, uh, strategy. Um, and because of the immature market, there's minimal brand value we see. Uh, because everything is new for a lot of consumers, um, or uh, many consumers buy something for the first time, and that could be like consumers of like consumer products, but I think also for business to business. Like if you're talking about the agricultural industry, a lot of companies buy their agricultural machines for the first time and really upgrading their um, their industry. So there's there's not really a brand value that they have worked on for with many years. And unfortunately, price is still usually key. I think that's an element that is changing quickly, um, where quality and service are becoming appreciated but i think over the, uh, generally price is usually still uh, key another reason why uh, china is challenging is because of uh, a local uh, company advantage we see that um, there's a, a restraint on foreign invested enterprises, targeted uh, regulatory enforcement, government support, uh, indigenous innovation policies, and limited financing options. So we see that there's still a lot of, um, uh, there's more opportunities for Chinese firms um, and Chinese uh, domestic firms are, are let free more easily than foreign companies. If there is a foreign company that is not uh, compliant, they will definitely um, find it and uh, find you more than another uh, Chinese company. So there's a targeted uh, uh, regulatory enforcement. And I think as a company, you need to be aware of, of that. Many people, when they come to China, they say like, oh, well, let's, we're in China, uh, as in China, do as, uh, do as the Chinese, as when in Rome, do as the Romans. But I think as a foreign company, you really need to uh, be doubtful of that statement. Yes, you're in China, you need to adjust to the Chinese market, the Chinese wishes, but I don't think you should do a Chinese company in the compliance side. So we often see that Chinese companies don't always follow all the compliances by the letter of the law. And I think I wouldn't advise any foreign company to um, do that because at one moment, it will come back to you. Um, other point, limited financing options. So um, a China a foreign company can't easily go to the bank and find uh, financing options or capital. Um, it's really um, restricted um, for uh, domestic companies. I'm not saying that it, it's not possible, but it's definitely a challenge. I think everything I also want to say, everything I say today is on a general basis. Maybe you as an individual company um, is, have been able to do it or will be able to do it. But I think um, in general, these are the challenges that are uh, there for Chinese, uh, for foreign companies uh, operating in China. So we had a lot of challenges. Um, we discussed um, what is difficult, but then um, let's see how we can address those um, challenges and make it easier to operate in the Chinese market. And I think I think it's, it's pretty simple. Um, 
And I think everybody knows this, but for some reason, when people, when we see companies enter, coming to China, they almost always leave their brains at home. For some reason, when they come to China, they see the opportunities, they see the big countries and they make choices what they that what they would have never made in Europe when they would enter another country. And I think if you want to enter the China's market correctly, you need to at least answer, uh, ask five basic questions. Is, are my products or services suitable for the Chinese market? What's the competitive situation? Are there potential partners needed? What is the best channel for market? And what structure is needed or any? I think, are my products service suitable? Have you done the research? Have you been to China? Is there maybe something already available in your field? And what's the competitive situation? Are there other foreign companies coming um, to China that are competitors? Are there domestic competitors uh, on the market that maybe uh, will make your life a little bit difficult? Do you need a partner um, in China? And if you need a partner, what kind of partner um, do you need? And uh, do research on your partner if you find uh, one. Don't take the first partner you meet on an expo. And what's the best uh, channel to market? Eh? Um, what ways uh, are there to enter the market? I will touch upon that a little bit later in the presentation because there's not uh, entering China doesn't automatically mean setting up a company and having boots on the ground. There are many different ways to enter the Chinese market. And because there are many different ways of entering the Chinese market, um, what is then, what structure do you need for that? And then I think we come to a, a, an important um, point on um, then why do I need to enter the market? Uh, why? So you've done all this research, you've answered these questions, and then why do I need to enter the market? Eh? Why do I need boots on the ground? And I think companies need to understand what the strategic reasons for entry are. Maybe it's an attractive market, eh? clear opportunities. I've mentioned the binding factors, uh, the binding indicators for the Chinese government. This could be a clear uh, indication again. Okay, I see that this is happening. I fit within this binding criteria. So that's why I want to go to the Chinese market. And that could be a pool um, factor. Uh, I think uh, a clear example of a pool factor was the time when the car industry came to, to China, Volkswagen, for example. Volkswagen asked their suppliers to say, uh, we're going to China, so you need to go to China. So that's a clear pool factor of why to go there. Uh, maybe there's a competitive threat. Uh, other competitors of you are going to the Chinese market. Maybe you also need to go to the Chinese market because you don't want to lose your existing clients because competitors are going to the Chinese uh, market. Maybe uh, there's a push uh, factor uh, that's, for example, for cost saving. Uh, cost saving could be a push factor for you because you want to um, make something in China that's cheaper or maybe find even um, the talent in China. I think a clear push factor for, for example, for the medical industry or the bio uh, biotech industry is that in China certain regulations are more um, relaxed on doing research or doing clinical uh, testing in, in China. So that's a clear push factor of why you would go uh, to China. But I think, again, these questions are important for yourself to answer. Then, how to come to China and what are the steps, what are the different ways to enter the Chinese market? Um, there, um, I would like to uh, discuss the difficulties and the risks of the different uh, uh, methods. So, I've made this slide in such a way on difficulty and risk. And I said already in, in my uh, talk that when you enter the Chinese market, it doesn't automatically mean that you need to have boots on the ground because there are different ways of doing it. Direct export. If a Chinese company comes to your company and says, we want to buy your product, 
um, and we do it at FOB, they do everything, they pay their bill, and it comes to China, I think that's not bad, right? You're, you're, selling, you're selling your products and it's going to China. It doesn't take you a lot of work, but of course the difficulty is maybe uh, you have no control, but maybe also uh, not so many uh, worries about it. Next step maybe is a licensing, a licensing agreement um, with companies in China to either produce or sell. There you could maybe see a branding risk, a production um, risk um, in China. Um, another step, what we see is um, a distribution or dealer. So if you go to China and you do a dealer or a distribution search, um, for uh, China to sell your products in your name. And I think there, uh, what is often mentioned is um, you find a distributor and the distributor says like, ah, yes, I would really like, like to do that, but I want to have exclusivity. And uh, our advice always is like, never give exclusivity. Or if you give exclusivity, make very clear uh, points in the contract on what that exclusivity means and the, the, the minimal amount of products that should be uh, bought from you. Because again, when I said in the beginning of the presentation, China is a huge, huge place. Not one distributor is able to cover the whole of China. It's, uh, it's, I think it's impossible. Same in Europe, you wouldn't have one distributor for Europe, right? That's the same for China. So therefore, we always say never give directly uh, uh, exclusivity to a distributor. Um, next step would be establishing a rep office. Uh, a rep office is a satellite. Uh, it represents your company in China, but it doesn't be able to do any commercial um, activity. And it leads um, an investment. Eh? You need to have personnel there. You need to have an accounting there. You need to have an office there. So it's a, it's a bigger a bigger investment. The last step we always see, uh, even though I'm in the business of setting up companies and providing um, um, support and accounting, our last step always is to advise establishing a company because establishing a company is it's difficult, it's costly, it takes a lot of investment, it takes a lot of commitment from a company to enter the Chinese uh, market, and you need to be ready for that. It's not you can't like tiptoe your way into China by setting up a company. It's a real um, commitment. And I think these are the different ways to enter the Chinese market. Of course, if you establish a, a, a foreign uh, invested enterprise, there's a lot of things you need to think about, but it goes a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation. I want to come back to uh, the beginning of the presentation where I said um, your self-diagnostic tool. A lot of, again, a lot of the, the things I've discussed is also discussed in the self-diagnostic tool. Again, it's for free, take it. A lot of questions are asked that makes you think. And I think that's also key for entering the Chinese market to think about uh, the Chinese uh, market, what all the elements are there that could be uh, new for you. Quickly, I want to discuss um, uh, what kind of structures is right for you. Um, if you saw the, 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 the slide uh, with the graph, uh, you have the representative office and the foreign and direct in, uh, uh, foreign invested enterprise option. I think these are two structures. Um, one structure that is uh, could be valuable for companies like uh, like you is to have a representative office. If you, for example, choose to have a distribution network there, but want to control your distribution network, a representative office could be valuable. Um, it does have some requirements. Your company needs to be less uh, two years old. Um, it makes an extension of your parent company, so it's not an uh, independent legal entity. It has a limited activity scope, meaning that you can't, you can only do marketing and uh, uh, marketing and uh, government relations or relationship management, but you can't do any business. You can't sign any contracts in China. I think this is an interesting um, setup for companies that um, help Chinese companies outside of China. 
So they want to have uh, boots on the ground in China to talk to their uh, clients, but most of the activity in the clients uh, is outside of China. A last, uh, no, not the last, the, 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 another option is uh, a typical foreign uh, invested enterprise, the WUFI, stands for Holy Foreign Owned Enterprise, meaning that all the shares of the company are owned by a foreign individual or entity, uh, a foreign invested uh, company. That is a limited liability company. Uh, that means that uh, risk is um, fixed within the entity. Um, I think that's always um, good to know if you enter the Chinese markets. It's also most commercial activities are allowed. Not everything was allowed. If you remember in the beginning, I said education um, is a difficult industry. For example, education is an industry that's highly regulated. Uh, that's, for example, not every foreign company can um, enter that. But also there are certain elements in the agriculture, for example, um, seed production. Uh, is seen as a strategic industry by China, so you can't go into seed production or, or um, uh, cultivation of seeds. So there are different so different elements you can and cannot go um, into. Um, then I think the last structure I want to quickly mention is the joint venture structure. Um, this is uh, useful for restricted industries. What I mentioned, for example, if you're in the seed, business or sometimes in education or in cloud computing or in autonomous driving. These are industries that are restricted, but through the ways of a joint venture and having a partner, you are able to enter into this uh, market. There's a lot of information online on what is called the negative list. So if you're in a business, type in uh, the negative list. I think the EU SME Center and FIT also has a lot of information about the negative list on um, which industry maybe need to have a, a joint venture uh, structure. It's also one of the most complex structures and needs a lot of preparation. So don't go into a joint venture just like, ah, oh, I met somebody uh, on the trade show. It was a nice person. I trust him completely and we are going to do a joint venture together. It has a lot of preparation. It's a lot of risk involved. The upside could be very big, but you need to commit. So as I said, what's the best good thing about a joint venture is the, uh, the, the potentially faster time to market, but a high risk of failure. If you look at all the joint ventures that have been uh, in the um, have been made in the in the past in China, a lot of are uh, unsuccessful. That doesn't mean that you can't be successful, but it needs again a lot of um, commitment. And I, I trust Johnny will uh, highlight a little bit how you can make a joint venture successful. Johnny has worked on uh, joint ventures and advised foreign companies on this. So I, I doubtful, I, I know, I'm pretty sure that he has some points to discuss uh, there. Uh, the key thing also is when a joint venture is having an exit strategy, uh, because let's say if it doesn't work, what are you going to uh, do um, um, to say goodbye to sometimes an unfortunate relationship? Um, key messages I want to share with you that I always tell uh, people, it's I think uh, lessons that you need to um, bring with you when you go to China. Everything is possible in China, but nothing is easy. When it sounds too good to be true, it's probably not true in China. Um, Guanxi dies or goes to jail. Uh, a lot of people say um, that I, I have good Guanxi, I can help you, I can help you make a shortcut. But I think as a foreign company, you should not take shortcuts because it will come back to you at one point. I think China is a trust society. I think definitely trust each other, but verify the trust because um, you would do the same. Um, in Europe, why not trust? Not why not verify the trust also in China? So, I think if you remember anything from this presentation, I hope these four points will guide you successfully towards your China um, China activity. Um, quickly, the upcoming events for uh, the EU SME Center. Um, on, I think, also a lot of industries that are interesting, smart water, building design, the Hainan free trade port, I think definitely interesting to look at. But this is all online, uh, you can also uh, find. There's going to be 11 new reports out, so please view uh, the uh, 
the website, the EU SME Center um, for all um, free information. So thank you. I think with this, I'm going to quickly hand the, uh, the mic over to Johnny. Okay, Robert, that was really a great presentation. I mean, uh, this was really clear and I have really seen all the steps you actually explained. And I really want to share with the audience, first of all, you do need to do these things, okay? They are very important that you follow this kind of a process of due diligence and you ask yourself the questions because there is, um, there is some kind of risk involved and there, of course there is also an opportunity. Now, as Robert also said, it's a very different place. And I'm gonna try and give you in a very short time, in 15 minutes, give you a taste of how different it is. So I'll start sharing my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Okay. Yes, Johnny, we can see. It. Okay. Voila. Good. Uh, first, very quickly. Um, yeah, my friends in China, they say I am an egg. I am white on the outside, but somehow they feel I've become a little bit yellow on the inside. So it seems to be a compliment. Um, I run a company in clean energy and carbon. I'm also owner of another company that provides strategic consulting and coaching on China. I'm setting up a fund with a bunch of uh, contacts on those four industries. And I also work with the European Chamber. I'm chairing the Environmental Working Group in uh, Shanghai. Um, yeah, I'm married in China. I've been there for 20 years and I, I like it. At this moment, actually, I'm not in China. I'm in Belgium, in Edegem for one more month. So if you would like to meet in person, it is very possible. So three things that I think are important for you to get a feel of how different China is. First of all, the digitization of the whole value chain. What does it mean for your go-to-market strategy? China is a plan economy. Well, that affects your business strategy and business partnerships. Well, they are, of course, with Chinese characteristics. So what does that mean? China is upgrading its whole industrial value chain. And this is much more impactful than you can imagine. I can share with you um, a very interesting sharing from the State Council just after COVID in March last year, where they were announcing that they were going to speed up the digitization, which already had started. This is the China 2025 manufacturing, actually. So imagine this. All the state-owned enterprises, private companies, institutes, universities, entrepreneur companies, even the farmers, they are all being connected to one digital system with very high bandwidth. And the data which is available in the country, and as you know, China does monitor data. You can see this very well in how the virus is being managed, what they can do with the data. Well, this data is now being centralized and being made available in a central way to those value chain. And they are igniting entrepreneurial companies to play with the different stakeholders in this industrial value chain to create a systemic upgrade of this value chain over the next two, three, four years to 2025. So imagine this, all processes, products, cooperations, models, getting access to big data and getting access to artificial intelligence to get an upgrade. So that is what is happening. And it's a plan economy. I'll explain in a minute. It means it is rolled out very systematically. So what does it mean for a go-to-market? Um, not sure if you know this, but at this moment, you can actually uh, access a lot of people in China very quickly if you use the digital channels. Now, it's not so obvious for a foreign company to just go and access those people. There are indeed very specific rules and regulations, but it is possible 
in the Chinese way. And this actually means that if you work with the right kind of parties that can give you access, you can go at a much faster speed and at a much lower cost into this market and also understand the market before you go into this market. It also allows you to over the value chain in a strategic way, determine which are the places where I'm going to play. And it's important to actually have a multi-point approach and to figure out where can I be a catalyst or a facilitator more than just only a control. If you're a control, you're vulnerable. Although you might think you're in control, actually you're vulnerable. Multi-point means you are much more protected. Now, what is the window of opportunity? Um, you might want to go to China and think in terms of um, there's a market for me, but you might also think that what is happening there is a bit ahead of a curve. When I arrived in China 20 years ago, they were 10 years behind. When I'm now in China, I see a country where the modern cities are five years ahead. Of course, we still have the countryside, which is maybe still 50 years behind, but they all have access to these modern tools. This is why digital farming is going incredibly fast. So how much are you, for example, able to enjoy a systemic upgrade of your processes and actually get an innovative boost working in China? First point. Second point. So China is a planned economy. What does that mean? Well, it means there is no debate between political parties about what is wrong and what is right. Now, this is where I want to also raise the issue of how politics and media are basically talking about China. And by the way, China also talking about the West. It is at this moment not very nice, as you know for sure. But I want to clearly make sure that the business people in China, they are business people just like you. And they want to work and do business. But they also understand what is the context of this planned economy. It's not something you can ignore. It's something you can you can't row against the flow, but you can definitely get wind under your wings by understanding where things are going. And China works basically very systematically in a triple helix model. So there's a central government, just like Robert showed just now, with goals, with KPI being rolled out. Now, at the provincial levels, at the city levels, at the industrial levels, these are all translated into sub KPI to roll them out. So for example, certain provinces are gonna get a certain requirement. This could be more for one industry or more for one aspect of the country. For example, security of food can be anything. So the different parts of the country have very specific goals and where they need to contribute to where the country is going. And the government, the local government is basically having this task. Now, the government officials, they go, up or down, depending to what extent they can actually help implement the planned economy. And this is very interesting because next to these governments, you then have the institutes, the universities. This is where all the research is happening. And then, of course, you have the industry, which in a very um, dynamic way tries to understand where are the opportunities that come with this. If I can help the government implement some of these things uh, with some of the research that's going on, or I can innovate for example, with the institutes to find solutions, then I'm going to get wind under my wings. I'm going to fly. So there is, I always say, China also has CSR. And it's somewhat similar to the concept of, of CSR that we know in the West. But in China, it's actually country social responsibility. And this is actually at the level of all of these three pillars and even at the level of the people. This is also why, although China has only one party, they do have a lot of support from the people. Now, if you understand this and you can find a way to work together in these three, with these three stakeholders in this triple helix model, you can get an endorsed and a facilitated rollout. What do I mean with that? If you find a solution in one place and you have a cooperation with the government, you're being endorsed. If you have a local innovation you're leading and if you work with local entrepreneurs you can tap into these most modern aspects 
of the digital value chain that can help you speed up. Now, if your model works in one place, you don't need to go and uh, promote it, brand it, uh, advertise it in other regions. Although these regions are different, almost like different countries, like Robert explained, um, the local people there understand from their perspective what they need to do from the planned economy in their region with their challenges, what they need. And they understand how your solution in one place actually can help them. So you're going to get phone calls. Could you come please here and also do the same thing? It surprises me each time when this happens, when we really found a solution that works. Two, three, partnerships with Chinese characteristics. Um, I want you to be aware that China at this moment is in the Yang Wei Zhong Yong period, which means we want to implement or use the foreign things for China's purposes. There was a time in the past where China would be like, oh, this is from abroad. Wow, we want this because this must be much better than we have. So, and over the time this has changed, China basically now has the opinion on the West and those who come to the West, well, you you want our market, of course, but your solution sometimes is outdated and, and you don't know this. And also you come with an opinion about how we should be doing things, which is quite annoying because in China, people first keep silent. They don't talk, they listen. And in the West, for example, we tend to start explaining, of course, how we want to help, how we have solutions, but it's just different. It's important to be aware of this. And the 80-20 cooperation transparency is something very interesting. So because this is the Chinese way of doing and thinking, you will see that when you work together with Chinese parties, and this is not only with foreigners, also Chinese people under each other, they are kind of putting on the table visibly what they're discussing to work together with you. Um, but they won't talk about 80%, which is most relevant for them because this is a vulnerability. And of course, this is their opportunity. And they will get an alignment around the 20%, but they will make sure that what you bring is going to give them also the 80%. Now, if you want to work with the Chinese party and you don't know what is the 80%, you're missing the point. They will knowing that. And it's important you know that because this gives you a chance that you go beyond one cycle. And I will explain this in a minute. Protection via the ecosystem basically means that if you're in this industrial value chain, have multiple control points or touch points, you're going to have different parties you're working with. You might be working with somebody in the government here, and you might be working with an entrepreneur there and with an institute there, and you might work with different people. So once you have a cooperation with Chinese people, you have a contract which clarifies the 20% in the right language to get the right kind of engagement. Then the question always is, so how much of that contract is going to be executed, right? How much can you rely on that? Well, I always say, wait until the big event comes because the big event is organized. It's very fascinating. So the way it is explained, what is it going to be done? And it's beautiful when you see Xi Jinping actually doing that. This is why the Chinese always have these words which sometimes sound bombastic or poetic or whatever, because for Chinese people, these characters, they are alive. Okay, They are representing much more than the words. If we in Belgium, for example, say East, West, Home, Best, Old, West, West, Best, these are just four words, but you also know they carry a lot more, right? They carry the whole context of the feeling of being at home and so on. So Chinese language characters basically also carry that in almost all their words. So the way you express your cooperation with which kind of words to which kind of audience shows which kind of commitment you're giving. And that actually is your protection. It is what protects your IP. It's what protects your competition, competitive position. That's why the ecosystem is so important. And this is why the triple helix is so important and the value chain. Now, context instead of time. As I just said, the language is different. Can you imagine? Chinese does not have times. They don't have past time, present tense, future tense. But they have all kinds of words which indicate context. So when you set up a cooperation with Chinese people, they think in terms of context. So we are bringing 
this to the table. 80-20, remember? Clear and unclear. And you're bringing that to the table, clear and unclear. Now, from a Western perspective, you're going to have like, okay, stage one, year one. And then after this year, we're going to review at the end of the year, we're going to go into the next year. And you may have a plan. But remember, the plan is 20%, not 100%. But the Chinese, they also have a plan. And this is the 80%. And they are having a timeline which is based on context. What do I mean with that? So today we work together on these topics. Not when one year has passed, but once these things have been achieved, what we have gotten from this cooperation, then this stage is finished. Suddenly you see the Chinese party change their behavior. They go to the next thing. Foreign party always says, what's happening? You're, you're, not, meet, you're, you're not keeping the, the agreement. Uh, uh, why are you doing this? And the Chinese party always says, how, how, why are you asking this question? Because for them, it is obvious. If you ask this question, basically, you're kind of out of the game because you're not understanding it. So on the other hand, if you, by that time, when this is finished, and you know this as well, because you also think in context, you're going to say, look, um, we could next work on this kind of cooperation, and you pick up something from their 80. Suddenly, you incredibly increase your, your position because you understand, you show you understand the game. Now, the game. You've got something unique. You're a foreigner. That means no Chinese can be more foreign than you, in the same way that I also realize I can never be more Chinese than a Chinese. And I also do not intend to be. If in your strategy you can leverage in and outside of China, you always have an advantage which you will continuously be able to bring to the table. If you're doing something within China only, remember that unless you start innovating locally, unless you are able to adapt your products to the local buyers, local solution selling, whatever innovative solution you have, it's going to be outdated in one or two years. Unless you innovate locally, and you're going to have something new, which is very interestingly having Chinese characteristics, but which, which is going to surprise you. It keeps surprising me. But those characteristics, they will also be very useful for you to know outside of China. And um, once you have a cooperation with China, you basically can go to other places. And you can, for example, think in the Belt and Road Initiative, or you can go simply to Latin America or Southeast Asia, because you have something to share in those areas and maybe also something to do together. Now, truth serves a purpose. As I said, there is talking and there is sharing and there is also my duty. In China, the duty is kind of an accountability. So individual right is kind of an accountability. It's very interesting to discover this. If you ask what is the intrinsic motivation of a Chinese, well, I want this as a person, but as a son of my parents, I want this. As a person working with this government, I want this. So these are part of the motivation. This also means that I'm only supposed to tell you the truth if you are entitled to hear the truth. Because if you are not having this kind of a position with me, you are not really relevant. You are not part of this circle. Then why would I expose myself to you? Why would I reveal myself to you? So it's very important to understand how these things play to understand how your relationship with the partner really is. And then the peaches and the coconuts. So when Western people come together, they come together like peaches. The skin is very thin on the outside and very easily it breaks. So when it breaks, you have contact. So you get to know each other very quickly. The meat of the peach start overlapping. So squeeze some juice comes out, but the, the stone in there, the core, the, uh, doesn't really overlap much. It's hard. Actually, it often not really overlaps. So the way people in, in, in the West cooperate is like this. Cooperate together very easily, but there's always some kind of like individualistic approach like you and me. Chinese are like coconuts. When they come together, they bounce. They don't trust each other. They don't trust other people. Very hard to get to know them. Very hard because this is the outside of the coconut. You have to really break through that coconut. But once you break through, what happens then? There's no stone, there's only liquid. The liquid flows together completely. So when you're working in China and you're able 
to have this kind of a cooperation, you're going to be a little bit uncomfortable because you are getting certain kind of responsibilities that you need to take, take care of the other party. It's very strange. You need to take care of a supplier or of a customer if they're in trouble because they're part of the ecosystem. They're part of the circle. If you're outside the circle, I mean, you're one, one of 1.4 billion. If you don't have food, you die. But if you're within the circle, that means you won't be killed and you will be protected in this multi point because you don't have, you don't, I want to protect you. Now, this is very important because things change so quickly in China. And as Robert also mentioned, there are these lists with um, um, invited uh, industries and, for example, industries which are prohibited. And China is very opportunistic. And let's be honest, many countries are like this. There is a regulatory system which kind of indicates what the country focuses on, what they want, what they don't want. And China is very protective in this way. And you need to know this because you might, for example, be very welcome and start doing something and you feel great. And then suddenly things start getting harder. For example, in specifically in the clean tech, uh, the environmental consultancy and the soil and groundwater, a lot opening in the beginning, but now because the knowledge is available, it suddenly has to be localized, it's protected, it's very difficult. So if you then haven't made it as a coconut to enter the ecosystem, you're vulnerable. If you're part of the ecosystem, you will have discussions with them in a much more transparent way because you are part of the 80-20 discussion. They'll be telling you, hey, you know, you have don't you have this kind of um, um, knowledge in the West or don't you have this kind of insight here in China that, that can help us to do something? You can have actually a totally different kind of cooperation and you will be guided into that. And that basically means you can go into the next cycle and you also start becoming part of the discussions of context instead of time. And this is where you can start um, being ahead of the curve, seeing where are the new opportunities. And they come, of course, with the local clients, local solutions, and they come with the local governments, which are indicating where's the next stage the government wants to take the country. And of course, with the universities, what are we able to do here? Because there's a lot of money being invested in China in some of these new systemic disruptive solutions. So I will end here with um, ride the wave until you become the wave, because this is from Li Bai. It's a, it's a Chinese poet. It was painted by a Japanese painter and it used in-depth painting techniques from Europe. For me, this is a token that cooperation can be possible and actually a very nice cooperation. Changfeng Polang basically stands for if the wind is very strong, the storm is very strong, the waves can actually become very high and that can be very scary. And the world in, of today has this kind of challenge. But circular economy and markets are presenting an opportunity to create change. Changes are happening faster than ever. Now, if the wind is very strong and the waves are touching the sky, if you can, can kind of surf on those waves, you can touch the sky. And you can do amazing things. So this is the expression. Remember, east-west, home-best. For the Chinese, this is what's currently happening. They're engaging in the process. You can be part of the people surfing on those waves, but you need to learn how to surf because falling off a wave, you will be drinking some salty water. Doesn't taste nice, but I think surfing is fun. And this is why I keep having fun in China and working with people that want to do something with China. Um, this is my last slide. These are my contact details. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can also have me on uh, WhatsApp and so on. Um, I very much like cooperating with people and I'm going to share in the chat, as was requested by Laura, a link for a survey. One second. Um, voila. That I hope you all to complete. You can do it after the event because I think um, I'd like to now give the word back to Ms. Surings and then prepare for the questions and answers. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, okay, thank you, Johnny. Um, thank you, Johnny and Robert for share, sharing your valuable insights and expertise. I can imagine there are some questions and comments uh, from the audience. Uh, I already saw one interesting questions, question, but before we go to the Q&A session, I will give a uh, short overview of the support and um, promotion tools we have available for Flemish companies. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, Michelle, we can see the screen. Okay, here we go. Um, so, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michelle Suings. I'm the Deputy Director um, for East Asia at the International Trade Department of Flanders Investment and Trade. Um, as said, I will give an overview of the support and export promotion tools we have available. Unfortunately, most of the information I will present is in Dutch and most of the services we offer are only for Flemish companies available. Uh, so my presentation uh, will be in Dutch. Um, ik ga kort een paar vormen van ondersteuning en exportpromotie geven op verschillende niveaus, op Vlaams niveau, Belgisch niveau en ook kort op Europees niveau. Wat Vlaanderen betreft uiteraard kan u steeds terecht bij de partners die um, in de vorige presentatie rond Clean Tech Route China reeds aan bod kwamen. Ik ga zelf nog kort even inzoomen op Flanders Investment and Trade, want Flanders Investment and Trade is het agentschap van de Vlaamse overheid dat werd opgericht om de Vlaamse export te ondersteunen en om buitenlandse investeerders naar Vlaanderen aan te trekken. Um, wij hebben in Vlaanderen vijf kantoren ter beschikking van de Vlaamse exporteurs in per uh, provinciehoofdstad en daar vindt u telkens onze adviseurs internationaal ondernemen. Um, wanneer u op hen beroep doet, dan is dat steeds gratis. Zij zijn uw eerste aanspreekpunt voor alle mogelijke informatie die u nodig heeft bij het exporteren, hulp die u wenst, vragen die u heeft, subsidieaanvragen die u graag beantwoord wilt zien enzovoort. Daarnaast hebben wij ook een netwerk in het buitenland. We hebben een negentigtal kantoren verspreid over de verschillende continenten. En we zijn uiteraard ook vertegenwoordigd in het Verre Oosten. Daarnaast, of voor een stukje ingebed in onze kantoren, hebben we ook tien Science and Technology Offices. Die zijn gevestigd in New York, Palo Alto, Parijs, Londen, Kopenhagen, München, Mumbai, Singapore, Tokio en last but not least ook in Guangzhou. Um, een van de opdrachten van deze uh, Science and Technology Officers is om de Vlaamse bedrijven, de onderzoekscentra, clusters, ondernemingsorganisaties, incubatoren, acceleratoren enzovoort te connecteren met de juiste relevante buitenlandse spelers. Uh, denk dan bijvoorbeeld aan sectorgenoten, um, prospects, partners, distributeurs, maar ook bijvoorbeeld potentiële investeerders, kapitaalverstrekkers en zelfs buitenlands talent. Um, deze Science and Technology Offices hebben elk hun eigen geografische focus en ook een uh, specifiek focusdomein. Voor China um, is dat het domein Digital Health um, en dan ook een stukje Health Tech uh, en waar nodig ondersteuning ook op vlak van Climate Tech. Ons netwerk in Greater China, vijf kantoren. We zitten in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou. Guangzhou met een plus omdat daar binnenkort onze Science and Technology Officer van start gaat. Hij zal in de zomer daar uh, op post zijn. Uh, en dan nog twee kantoren in uh, uh, buiten mainland China, in Hongkong en in Taiwan. Waarvoor kan u bij hen terecht? Onze buitenlandkantoren beantwoorden ook uw vragen specifiek gelinkt aan de betrokken exportmarkt. Zij kunnen eventueel ondersteuning bieden bij specifieke problemen of u doorverwijzen naar de juiste actoren die u kunnen bijstaan. Um, Michelle, zorgen... sorry, uw, uw PowerPoint verspringt niet. 
Ze blijft vaststaan op de eerste slide. Michel, gewoon nog wel vijf duur. Uh. Nog steeds niet? Nee. Ik zal even stoppen met delen en opnieuw delen. Ook als je gewoon naar presentation mode gaat, ga je waarschijnlijk dat uh, de juiste manier krijgen. Nu zien we ze goed. Oké. Okay. En verspringen ze nu mee, de slides? Ze zijn mee. Oké. Okay. Mijn excuses. Um, voilà, dan. Um, dat voor... Uh, nee, ik ga nog even... Kleine toelichting geven bij onze buitenlandkantoren. Dus uh, wat zij daarnaast ook doen, is u in contact brengen met potentiële Chinese zakenpartners. Dat kan zowel gebeuren op individuele basis, dus wanneer u op uh, individuele prospectiereis gaat, maar ook begeleiding via groepsactiviteiten zoals groepszakenreizen of beursdeelnames. Um, dan is er ook heel wat informatie beschikbaar op onze website. Um, zo vindt u daar bijvoorbeeld de exportgids. De exportgids is eigenlijk een handleiding uh, voor Vlaamse bedrijven die willen starten met exporteren, die een exportplan willen opstarten. Uh, u vindt hierbij um, richtlijnen over hoe u uw markten kan kiezen en verkennen, hoe u de marktbenadering aanpakt, hoe u dit financieel, juridisch en logistiek voorbereidt. Uh, er is ook een luikje over marketing. U kan dat uiteraard allemaal zelf bestuderen, maar wie dat wenst, kan dat zeker doen onder begeleiding van een van onze adviseurs internationaal ondernemen. Um, daarnaast is er ook nog, uh, zijn er ook nog een aantal specifieke dossiers te vinden um, bij, in deze exportgids. Dat gaat vaak over actuele onderwerpen. Op dit moment is er bijvoorbeeld een coronadossier beschikbaar. Er is ook een brexit-dossier. U vindt er ook een dossiertje over Expo Dubai, waaraan wij later dit jaar nog zullen deelnemen. En u vindt er ook een uh, aantal uh, rapporten en analyses over de wereldeconomie, bilaterale handel enzovoort. Verder vindt u op de website ook een aantal landenpagina's. Op die landenpagina's is vaak een luikje opgenomen over het coronavirus en de situatie in de lokale markt. Daarnaast vindt u cijfergegevens over de betrokken markt, kansrijke sectoren, tips, tricks, do's en don'ts over zaken doen, de relevante wetgeving en regelgeving. U vindt er ook reisinformatie en nuttige adressen. En u vindt er de overzichten van de acties en events die we organiseren op de betrokken markt. U vindt er ook de handelsvoorstellen en aanbestedingen die onze buitenlandkantoren voor u gedetecteerd hebben. En u vindt er de marktstudies en nieuwsberichten. Een greep uit de marktstudies voor China die op dit moment beschikbaar zijn, onder meer eentje over de health food market, over innovatie, over water treatment industry, nanotechnologie. Maar er is nog veel meer beschikbaar. Dat is allemaal gratis te downloaden op onze website. U vindt er ook de informatie over de subsidiering en financiering die beschikbaar is voor Vlaamse exporteurs. Er zijn vijf types van financiering, van subsidiering die wij voorzien. U vindt hier het overzicht. Ik ga ze niet in detail behandelen, want ik zie dat we een beetje over tijd aan het gaan zijn. Belangrijk om te weten is dat voor het tweede type, dus de subsidiering voor buitenlandse beurs- en niche-events, op dit moment ook kan aangewend worden voor virtuele evenementen of andere alternatieven dan de fysieke evenementen die uiteraard door de coronapandemie niet kunnen plaatsvinden op dit moment. Dan nog twee uitzonderlijke uh, financierings, 
pakketten. Uh, ten eerste was er de bijzondere exportteun, exportsteun Brexit voor ervaren exporteurs. Die oproep is intussen afgelopen. Op dit moment is er geen nieuws of er een nieuwe oproep zal komen. Um, er was ook een starterspak inter internationalisering. Die oproep is afgelopen, maar er zal een nieuwe oproep komen in september 2021. Voor wie is dit bedoeld? Dat gaat eigenlijk over een subsidie voor Vlaamse KMO's die nog nooit eerder een subsidie van FIT gekregen hebben. We mikken hierbij op vooral innovatieve ondernemingen die starten met exporteren. Indien nu graag op de hoogte wordt gehouden wanneer dat die oproep uh, opnieuw opgestart wordt, dan kan u best een account maken via onze website, een MyFit account, en daar aanduiden dat u dergelijke informatie wilt ontvangen via mailings of nieuwsbrieven. Dan tot slot nog de acties en events die wij organiseren. Voor 2021 hebben we nog een aantal acties op het programma staan. Wat in het rood aangemerkt is, um, staat nog op het programma, maar de inschrijvingen zijn helaas afgesloten. De andere acties die staan nog steeds open. Het eerste op het programma, dat zijn de Clean Tech Route China webinars, die we op, die we, waarmee we vandaag van start zijn gegaan. Ze lopen nog tot 1 mei, elke dinsdagochtend om 9 uur. Uh, verder hebben we nog een virtuele groepszakenreis naar Chengdu en Chongqing gepland van 7 tot 11 juni. Daarvoor kan nog steeds ingeschreven worden. We nemen deel aan de IE Expo in Guangzhou van 15 tot 17 september. Dat is een Cleantech Expo, zoals daar straks ook al is toegelicht door Sarah. Um, verder nemen we deel aan de China International Logistics and Supply Chain Fair van 23 tot 25 september, uiteraard voor de logistieke sector. We staan op Food and Hotel China van 9 tot 11 november. En we zijn ook aanwezig op de China High Tech Fair van 17 tot 21 november. Tot slot hebben we ook nog een groepszakenreis op het programma met een focus op biotech, life sciences, medtech en healthcare onder leiding van minister-president Jan Bon. Die was gepland voor dit najaar. Maar zoals de verwachtingen op dit moment zijn, zal reizen naar China niet mogelijk zijn en zullen we moeten uitstellen naar het voorjaar van 2022. Dan kort nog even iets over een federale vorm van ondersteuning voor exporteurs die eigenlijk weinig gekend is, maar al zeer dikwijls heel nuttig is gebleken. Um, de federale overheid heeft een vijftal douaneattachés uitgezonden naar de, vijf, naar de vier BRICS plus Indonesië. Wat doen die douaneattachés? Um, zij bieden ondersteuning en inlichting uiteraard over douane- en accijnsregelgeving, bijvoorbeeld over beschuldigde belastingen bij invoer, over invoerprocedures, maar zij bieden ook ondersteuning bij um, specifieke problemen uh, die u kan tegenkomen bij uitvoer. Uh, we hebben dus ook een douaneattaché in China, die is gevestigd in onze ambassade in Beijing. En dan uh, het laatste stukje, de ondersteuning op Europees niveau. Zoals u daarnet al gehoord heeft, zeer uitgebreide en nuttige uh, ondersteuning door het EU SME Center. Um, een gelijkaardig Center of Helpdesk bestaat er ook specifiek voor intellectuele eigendomsrechten. De China IP SME Helpdesk, die onze partner zal zijn voor het derde webinar, wanneer het specifiek over IP-bescherming in China gaat. Dan is er ook nog. Um, en Rich. en Rich is ook gepromoot door, het, door de Europese Commissie via Horizon 2020. En is eigenlijk een netwerk dat diensten aanbiedt, ondersteuning aanbiedt, specifiek voor um, science, uh, technology en innovation, bedrijven, sectoren, federaties enzovoort. Er is zowel ondersteuning op uh, groepsniveau, op dit moment um, hoofdzakelijk in de vorm van webinars, maar zij geven ook individueel op maat gemaakt advies en ondersteuning. En dan tot slot de Access to Markets. Uh, dat is de vroegere Market Access Database, een zeer nuttige uh, website. Um, die valt onder de Europese Commissie onder DG Trade. Daar vindt u allerlei informatie, onder meer over vrijhandelsakkoorden, informatie voor Europese exporteurs uh, wat betreft importvoorwaarden in derde markten, importtarieven, procedures, documenten die u zou nodig hebben bij uw export, informatie over handelsbelemmeringen in specifieke markten, 
uh, de sanitaire en fytosanitaire uh, vereisten voor specifieke markten en een hele hoop statistieken en cijfergegevens. Dit is echt een zeer nuttig startpunt voor bedrijven die nieuwe markten verkennen. Voilà, dit was mijn presentatie. Um, de conclusie en mijn boodschap aan exporteurs is... Um, eigenlijk dat er enorm veel informatie en ondersteuning beschikbaar is. Eerste lijns informatie is bovendien vaak gratis. Er is ook financiële ondersteuning beschikbaar. Dus wanneer je over de landsgrenzen heen, heen kijkt, maak er zeker gebruik van. Veel succes. Dank u wel. Well, thank you, uh, Michel, um, for your presentation. And I think all the speakers have um, very much met the expectations that we had. In a way, they've even overdone it a little bit. I hear, uh, I heard Robert say that China is a minefield and um, that some of uh, Western enterprises go to China and leave their brains at home. So it all uh, shows that you need a lot of preparation. Johnny also put a lot of um, uh, emphasis on the cultural differences. And I think the questions also basically go into that uh, area. And I think if we put up these questions at the moment that we are already running over time, the answer um, has to be, uh, can't be, you know, worded in, in, in a very uh, short while. So I would suggest that um, the questions uh, are uh, put straight into the mailboxes of the uh, different uh, organizers and participants in the uh, webinar. Um, There have been uh, some specific questions also. I see one on the how, whether the Chinese government can help. Uh, it says here WIFE. I suppose it is, uh, the question is not whether the Chinese government can help the wife with funding, but a wholly owned foreign enterprise. Um, this is a very technical question. I think you have to go to the um, uh, uh, SME center. I'm sure you can get a, a, an answer there. Um, somebody asked for more uh, information that can be found in books and I think uh, Johnny already gave some hints on what is interesting material to read when you think about uh, going to China. So um, with this, I think I would like to conclude and, and basically thank uh, Flanders Investment and Trade, Michel Surings in particular, um, for organizing, co-organizing the event. I thank our speakers, that is uh, Sarah Landuit from POM Antwerpen, Robert and Johnny from the EU SME Center. Again, look at their respective websites. Um, there are plenty of uh, interesting events being scheduled by POM Antwerpen, by the EU SME Center. I think even for the month of May, we saw four or five uh, of that on their website. So. Um, Make sure that you remember also what uh, Robert said, be prepared, preparation is everything in China. And um, finally, I think also as for the Belgian Chinese Chamber of Commerce, we look forward to seeing much more of you in the near future. So thank you very much and um, have success with your approach of the Chinese market. Thank you and bye bye.